Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah. Where are the children? Uh, they will, I guess, like I saw uh, Chandan has posted the link. Vidat will be logging on right in, in Vidat. I think he's trying. Okay. Okay. And only three. Yeah. You, me, and Vidat, and Jed. Atulaya is there. Atulaya. Atulaya is there? Yeah. You can see him, right? No, I cannot see anybody else except two of you. Atula Senavi Ratna is there. But, yeah, well, I don't see him. Oh. Ah, yeah, his name is here, right? Okay. Nice. Ah, this is a new, new child. New <laughs> child. <laughs> <laughs> new child. <laughs> and the fifth child also okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Where are the children? I will remind them. This this morning there were 102 people. Yeah. Now only five, including me. Okay. Uh, are the children are not here? Uh, not yet, Tam Druni. I have sent them another reminder, but uh, hmm. with that, do you, do you have the inform uh, contact information for uh, Pravit and Elit? If you do, can you contact them? Um, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, thanks. Today, I'm going to talk on uh, uh, mindfulness. That is a very, very important uh, subject. Uh, it's good for uh, all young and old and in the in the noble eightfold path uh, This is considered to be 
the most important part. Uh, so, anyway, this talk is being recorded and they can listen to it on YouTube. Uh, I hope they know how to go to YouTube to listen to this talk. Dana Vijayana Dina Guna Vidane Ekauda. Troy, is that you? Uh, I'm Grene, it's me, Troy's mother. Whose mother? Troy's. Troy Gunawadana. Oh. Okay. Uh, Dilsani is there. All are uh, little children today. <laughs> Dilsani, Dina, and Pravit, okay, Vidat, Pravit is a child, I think, at least there are nine, uh, please hurry up, run to the class. <laughs> okay, this is uh, Nelith, Nelith, this Nelith, okay. Pravit Nelith Vidat and uh, okay, at least Nine of you are here. Okay. Maybe in one room there may be more than one. So let me begin. Uh, today I want to talk on the seventh steps of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, I want to remind uh, Everybody once again, Noble Eightfold Path is right understanding, right thinking, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. Okay, we passed uh, six steps. Today is the seventh. Since this subject is very, very important, I will not uh, finish it in one day, in one half hour. I will continue this even next week. You may listen to several talks on mindfulness. This is the first of that. My original plan was to give only eight talks, but I cannot finish it in eight and cannot uh, do the justice to the subject, uh, nor to you. And therefore, uh, today I speak a part of uh, mindfulness, and then you ask me questions. This is how it is. <clears throat> in our daily life, mindfulness we have to practice in daily life. This is not something that you uh, do once and uh, uh, forget the rest of your life. This is something we have to do every day. Just like you breathe, 
drink, eat, exercise and so forth. You do various activities every day. We all, we all speak, we think and we work. In all this, these are called the places where we practice mindfulness. Not limited to sitting, standing, walking, but it pervades our entire activities. And that is why it is so important for us to remember. <clears throat> Suppose we, I take a very simple common example. Suppose we get involved in conversation. This very normal thing that happens to everybody. In the, this conversation may be on maybe on Dhamma, like we learn the Kale and Dhamma Sakacha, discussion of Dhamma at suitable moment. And then what is the suitable moment? Suitable moment is the moment that we are breathing, living, eating, drinking, walking, and so forth. All these are suitable moments. But for Dhamma discussion, one has to be in one place and have a conversation. Dhamma discussion is another conversation. Our intention is to learn Dhamma, practice Dhamma, live according to Dhamma. And during this conversation, all of a sudden, one person thinks that person is right, other person is wrong. As soon as this thought arises in that person's mind, then he tries to belittle other person or say something indirectly to hurt the person or may say something to show off in order to show the other person that he knows more and so forth. See, the intention was a very good one. Intention was to learn Dhamma, discuss Dhamma. But what happened during this conversation? Suddenly, you slip your mindfulness. At that time, if you are not mindful, you say something to hurt the other person or to make the person feel very bad. So you build up some sense of superiority complex or inferior, inferiority complex. And this all happened because of our not being mindful. So we, when we have a conversation, mindfulness always reminds us to do the right thing, make the right speech. We learn among the Noble Eightfold Path, number four is right speech, <coughs> no, right, th right uh, understanding, right thinking, and then right to number three, right speech. So we, mindfulness must come handy when we make a discussion, conversation, so that we con can continue conversation very smoothly. This morning I mentioned to adults answering their question, assuming that you are leading a cow in a paddy field, rice field, the road that you take is just a divider between one paddy field 
and the next, very narrow road. But this cow is so used to eating very green grass. Seeing this paddy field, this cow's face naturally turned towards the right, left. And then the man behind the cow, who leads the cow to stables, the cow pen or somewhere, has a cane in his hand. When the cow turns to the left side to eat paddy plants, then this man uses his cane and tap. Then cow brings his face back to the original position in the center. Next time the cow goes to the right side because the, gra the green is so tempting. Then again this man uses his cane and tap so the cow remains on the straight path. Mindfulness is like that, like the cane. The, the cow is our mind, unmindful mind, desire. So mindfulness always has to train the mind to stay on the course, on the right path. See how important it is, the mindfulness is in our daily conversation. Now, therefore, <clears throat> before we commit any harmful thoughts, words, deeds, which turns into a karma, any thoughts, words, deeds committed with intention, if it is wholesome, it is a wholesome karma. If it is unwholesome, it is unwholesome karma. And therefore, in order to make our karma wholesome, mindfulness must be present. The moment we become unmindful, we commit unwholesome karma. And therefore, to, for committing karma, mindfulness is very, very important. Sometimes we get carried away with unnecessary conversation. And we have spent long time because it is full of jokes and uh, talking about other people and uh, criticizing others, uh, so forth and so on. These are all considered to be useless talk or gossip. <clears throat> People very, very much like to gossip, engaged in unnecessary conversation. Sometimes this unnecessary conversation can end in trouble because one of those persons in that conversation can carry this message un in perhaps unintentionally to another person and that person may add more salt into it and then bring to another person and eventually this, this can end up in big <coughs> quarrel, trouble and so forth. So you can see how harmful it becomes, it can be to us. Also, during conversation, greed can arise, hatred can arise, delusion can arise. These are very, very negative, very harmful mental states. Often people ask me how to practice mindfulness in our daily life. Greed, hatred, and delusion arise in our daily life. 
as soon as greed arises, immediately we become mindful of the fact that greed is in the mind. When anger arises while in, during conversation, immediately we must become mindful of the presence of anger. And if confusion arises or delusion arises or distorted perception arises in the mind, we immediately become mindful of that and clear that if greed arises, let it go. Don't try to nourish it, support it, nip in the bud. You can nip in the bud only if you are mindful. Mindful, that reminds you that this is greed, greed, <coughs> greed, breed, sorrow, lamentation, pain. And therefore we try to cut it, remove it, chip off and uproot eventually. Not at once, but we have to train the mind to do that with mindfulness. Greed is called a fire. Raga Aggi. <coughs> Aggi means fire in Pali. Raga Aggi. And then anger can arise. Anger is, uh, you can see the the harm of anger immediately, very that very instant. We all know when anger arises, if we do not take care of it with mindfulness, at the moment it is arisen, then you allow it to grow. When it grows, it becomes so unmanageably big problem. We cannot manage it. When we get angry, even conversations, you don't feel happy. You, do, you feel very uncomfortable. Your heart beats faster. Your lips can get dry. Mouth will be dry. You, your conversation is not going on smoothly and you may even get confused, you may not choose the right words, and all these problems we can experience right then and there. Anger is fire. Anger is enemy. When you have, suppose you have an enemy, as a person, <coughs> your anger can cause you more harm to you than all the enemies outside. You can see the enemies coming closer, but you don't see anger arising within yourself. Anger arises within yourself and eats you up. If we let it, let it grow again and again, unmindfully we nourish it, then eventually we develop very, very unpleasant life. I tell you, there is a very beautiful simile that Buddha used, that is uh, uh, Kira Rukubama. Kira Rukka means milk tree. There is a tree, wherever you poke, you get milk comes out of it. Whenever you poke the tree, milk comes out of it. Similarly, if we have anger letting settle in our mind, Anytime anything can make we ang make us angry and then if somebody says something, anger comes out.
like milk or the tree. If somebody looks at you in a sort of unfriendly way, anger comes out. When somebody does something, anger comes out. When the politician does, does something, anger comes out. When the, uh, the neighbor does something to hurt you, your anger comes out. So anger is in you, it comes out of you at any time and make, the, make your life very, very unhappy and miserable. And then Buddha compared anger to a sick person. <coughs> when somebody is sick, that person cannot appreciate food. Any delicious food that your mother, father, somebody gives you, you find it not taste, it is bland. Similarly, you cannot appreciate anybody. You always want to criticize that person because of your anger. You cannot appreciate anybody's success, anybody's appearance, any, anybody's achievement. Therefore, you hurt yourself when you nourish your anger because of your unmindful behavior. And the third is uh, confusion. We get even more uh, into trouble, into, into more trouble when the mind is confused. Friends, this mind is luminous. <coughs> uh, look at these little children. Let these little children, little ones, no matter what you do, they may little get upset and cry and next moment they are okay. They don't conceive grudge and they don't say, uh, tomorrow I will talk to you, to, I will do something to hurt you more. Conceive grudge in him. But the little children, they don't do that. Tomorrow also they will be like very fresh flowers. Beautiful, very pleasant. Why? They don't hold grudge. Not because they are mindful, <coughs> but that is their nature. Adults can come to that not becoming like children, crawling on their force like children, babies. But we can bring our mind back to that state if we remain mindful and relaxed and no any uh, confusion. So the anger, <coughs> this pure, beautiful, pleasant, shining, innocent mind can become polluted with adventitious outside sensory objects. And we can prevent that happening by practicing mindfulness. Sometimes people uh, ask uh, if we close our eyes and shut our ears, can we practice mindfulness easily? If that is so, all the blinds and deaf should be able to practice mindfulness because they don't see or hear. But Buddha advised us to practice mindfulness with all the senses in good condition. Health is very important. Healthy people can practice mindfulness better than unhealthy people. So our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and mind be mind should be in good condition so that when objects like form, uh, 
sound, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch and thought arise in the mind. We can remain mindful. What does the mindful do? Mindfulness, what does mindfulness do? Mindfulness, very important part of mindfulness is that whatever arises, whatever arises passes away. <coughs> whatever arises passes away. You listen to a, even to this sound of mind coming through these electronic devices. You can see them coming in waves, sound waves, not one single solid sound. You don't find a solid sound. Sound comes in waves and these waves are changing. Waves are changing. When you see an object, even if you close your eyes, those objects come back to your mind from your memory. And then, if you pay attention to that particular object, that image, that remains in your mind as a memory, pay attention to it, it slowly fades away. You have to look at it, look at the object, and it bring back to and refresh your image. Why? Because it is fading away, appearing and disappearing. So, when mindfulness is developed, we see this happening to us. Our emotions are changing. Anger is changing. It wears out. It also goes through birth, decay and death. Anger arising is the birth of anger and slowly fading away of anger is its decay. Disappearing anger is anger's death. And even the anger is not some permanent eternal substance. It is arising and passing away. <coughs> Yeah. For instance, uh, you may be involved in criticizing others or pointing your finger at uh, somebody or accusing somebody or finding faults in somebody. At that moment, immediately pay attention to your mind. I said the mind among we have both mind and body. Mind is more important than the body. And that is why Buddha said, Mano Pubbhangama Dhamma. Mind is the forerunner. Mind is the chief. Everything is mind made. We can make our life happy or unhappy according to the way we use our mindfulness. We want to live a happy life, peaceful life. The, it is the mindfulness that brings peace and happiness to our life. Even if you have concentration, that concentration doesn't stay too long. Concentration doesn't stay too long. But mindfulness can stay very, very long time all our life, whether sitting, standing, walking, lying down, eating, drinking, talking, um, and wearing clothes, all these moments, mindfulness can be practiced. So, therefore, in order to maintain our peace, we have to practice mindfulness, not concentration. Concentration is necessary to some extent, but more important is mindfulness. 
you pay attention to uh, what is happening only we pay when we pay attention to something that particular thing becomes clear to us if we do not pay attention to it and nothing can be very clear to us this is one aspect of mindfulness paying total undivided attention that is why when buddha delivered a sermon at the end of the sermon the person sitting on a in front of him would say venerable sir the sermon is beautiful and venerable sir sermon is beautiful it's like turning a pot which has been turned down you turn it up when you turn the pot that was turned down when you turn it up with person with good eyesight can see what is inside nikkujitanga ukkujeya they said in pali and when you uh, open something that is closed one who with eyesight can see that object it is just like bringing light into a dark room for someone to see the object in the room it is just like leading somebody who got lost in a desert leading to a city or village it is just like that your sermon is wonderful marvelous how can he say that because he paid mindful attention to every word the preacher or the buddha taught and at the end this person says very sometimes inwardly sometimes outwardly he says yang kinti samudaya dhammam sabbantan nirodhammam whatever comes into existence goes out of existence whatever comes into existence goes out of existence and that instant that person attains what we call stream entry super human attainment so mindfulness can go all the way until we attain full enlightenment uh i think next week i will talk more about it today you can ask me how i can stop here because even though mindfulness is such a wonderful subject uh, i can keep talking on that for a l- long time perhaps uh, that may be uh, too much for uh, young people perhaps some of them may have not heard them before the when you listen to it for the first time uh, you cannot focus your mind until the talk is over if i give a one hour talk and therefore i want to stop it right now and invite you to ask me questions bante i have a question is it n- nelit yes that's me Yeah very good now let's ask it little, clearly loudly i will be happy to answer Okay so this question is about intention and wholesome karma Yeah so new jersey there's been this invasion of a certain bug called a spotted lantern fly and this bug is very bad to the agriculture and it's bad to like the crops and everything So the state government has said if you were to see one of them uh, you have to kill them or uh, you you they hide they extremely recommend you kill them and that you uh, report it so uh, as buddhists our in, our 
five precepts say not to kill but in this moment it's good for the agriculture and if you want to do something then you would be impacting your society and impacting other people so what's the right call as buddhists do we kill them or do we let them live i think it is very good for you not to kill the killing uh, is is really really bad karma because you have to have an intention to kill because you have no right to deprive others of their living and they all have right to live now there may be many especially these days uh, uh, really uh, modern technology is so advanced so advanced that they can find ways and means to do the agriculture without killing insects they may use ways of ways to drive them away from their uh, crops uh, rather than killing uh, you know when i remember when uh, we were in sri lanka some people were so conscious about this precept that when they cultivate their uh, paddy field and during the harvest they don't harvest the entire crops they leave little section for birds to eat <laughs> so they are so kind so compassionate so loving and so conscious about this precept that they leave a portion of the the, the crops for the birds and other animals to eat i don't think people will do that nowadays but uh, when they uh find various means i would very much like to hear someone coming up with new method of uh, uh, cultivating without killing any insect okay okay thank you bante but uh, i agree with what you said but uh, this this uh, bug that's here it's invasive and it's bad for uh, everybody pretty much because it also can take over trees and can rot in them so it's too uh, it's a threat to the society so what uh, do you recommend we do not kill them even though it poses a risk <clears throat> um if there is a way to deter them rather than killing and uh, i would recommend that sometimes people think that they uh, uh bring uh, germs from other uh, sick uh, beings uh, in, in they spread diseases they spread diseases therefore it, it is human life is more valuable than animal's life and therefore they thought uh, they maybe that's their rationale and with this reasoning uh, they kill uh but people long before this new insecticide uh, was uh, invented people lived with all kind of insects and they all did not get uh, infected by uh, other uh, the, uh, what the insect infected with various diseases they lived and uh, i am not suggesting we are, uh, that we must go back to the various primitive pre historic uh, period but my suggestion is uh, for instance you know when we have uh, ants uh, in our rooms what we do we do two things 
there are devices that pro that generate uh, s s very uh, maybe very very high pitch uh, sound waves that will uh, that will be so very strong for this little insect they don't get they don't get in come in uh, another device is uh, that we use is you know this uh, this uh, eucalyptus oil uh, they are very strong smell they have so we put one drop in certain place all the ants will run away <laughs> they don't get close to uh, that particular place we want to protect i have seen sometimes children when they eat if many ants come uh, they put little food away and then all the ants go there and eat that food doesn't bother the child like that there can be various means uh, for to deter them Uh, make them go away from us and uh, we can save their life <coughs> okay thank you bante okay okay um look i have a question yes um So earlier you said um, that only a healthy person with like full control of their senses can uh, achieve like uh, mindfulness. Yes. Um, so does that mean that even if a, like a deaf or uh, a blind person is healthy, does that mean they can't achieve mindfulness? Oh, sure they can do. They can practice mindfulness. Uh, they can... Uh, Although they cannot hear, they cannot see, but other senses are working: smelling, tasting, touching, and so forth. So long as the nervous system is in good condition, uh, they can practice. Uh, if they, there are various ways to teach uh, uh, the blind using the braille system. and uh, also there may be ways to teach deaf persons in these days using those methods they can practice surely they can do but i i said what i said was uh, the uh, healthy person has uh, more opportunities uh, less uh, uh, handicaps therefore healthy person can meditate practice mindfulness uh, better than unhealed the person even one is very sick one is very sick uh, for instance uh, having cancer i know a couple of people who pre- who had cancer they even did not take chemotherapy or radiation or anything until they die they meditate one person very famous person uh, the founding general secretary of united nation had cancer and when people went to see him he was describing to them where the cancer was and how it moves cancer cancer cells moves to other areas in his uh, ear area and he never t- took any medicine i don't know whether they had they have uh, radiation or chemotherapy and those uh, available there might have been some other means to treat uh, cancer i heard i have not seen this that i heard that he did not take any medicine and he just used his meditation mindfulness he was so involved in meditation in uno building there is a room at his request they dedicated that room for meditation he is a burmese and so involved in meditation 
So until he died, he did not use any medicine. He practiced meditation. I know another person, he was, uh, uh, his uh, uh, son Francis, he is not that famous Christian friend Francis, but he is a British. Later on he became uh, Anagarika, then his name was Anagarika Sugatananda. Anagarika Sugatananda. And he too died of cancer without taking any cancer medicine, but using meditation, mindfulness to, uh, to accept the cancer and uh, use the pain for his meditation. So, unhealthy person also can meditate. What I said was healthy people have better opportunities. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You are welcome. <clears throat> Uh, any any other question? Hamdulna, uh, I have a question actually. Uh, so, how do you relate mindfulness and meditation? Uh, very good. Uh, meditation is a general subject. Uh, Mindfulness is part of it. Uh, meditation involves in concentration, contemplation, uh, gaining uh, what you call various uh, uh, powers. Like before the Buddha came into existence, there were sages, rishis, Munis, mendicants, uh, who meditated and attained even a status called, states called jhanas. Uh, there are two kinds, rupa vachara, arupa vachara. Uh, using material object, they gain concentration, that's called rupa vachara, uh, jhana. Without using particular object, they gain uh, concentration, that is called arupavachara. Using concept, they use, they gain concentration. These are all meditation. What, the, even Siddhartha Gautama, before he attained enlightenment, they followed those uh, people who meditated, gained concentration, and then he found out uh, all the all his teachers, you know, as you know, famous teachers are Arkara, Uddhakan, Ramput, and so forth. They practice meditation, but they have not attained enlightenment <coughs> because they just gain concentration, and they became attached to that bliss of concentration. Concentration actually is so peaceful, so blissful. Uh, one can stay in that uh, for a long time without hearing, without uh, seeing and feeling anything. It's a very blissful. So uh, that is uh, very tempting. So they were attached to it. As a result, when they died, they were reborn in what is called Brahma realms. Uh, supernormal realms and they stay in those realms for not only hundreds or thousands of years but eons they live there but Buddha saw that Buddha attained that and then Buddha saw this is going into Sangsaric cycle, Sangsara cycle, going round and round and round and round, from there come down to human realm, and sometimes can even go to animal realm, even if they uh, commit very bad come go even to hell realms, uh, you know, and so forth. 
and then when they go do something good to come, they rise us up like uh, like this uh, you know evolutionary process. Uh, evolution goes all in one way, going up, 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 up. <clears throat> but the Buddha taught not only evolution, but it's an even a revolution, going up, 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 and, and then going down, 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 and up and down, up and down. So uh, for them, it was unidirectional. Buddha taught multidirectional system. So unidirectional system is called uh, concentration meditation. Multidirectional system also called concentration meditation. But the liberation from that whole repetition is not in those concentration system. And that is what Buddha discovered. And that is called mindfulness or sati or vipassana. And that's what we are trying to practice and teach. Concentration you can gain from anything. That's re relatively easier. Of course, not everybody gains concentration that easily, but uh, very easy. Mindfulness is easier than concentration if you know how to practice mindfulness. <coughs> As I said, we can practice mindfulness right now while I'm talking. But you cannot practice concentration while I'm talking. That becomes sort of a hindrance or impediment. So the meditation is a general topic which has concentration, attaining jhanas and so forth. Mindfulness is a very specific uh, area of meditation which liberates ourselves from this repetition of birth and death. There are many things to say about it. <clears throat> if you follow the, uh, that, that path, you certainly can be reborn and having very beautiful, pleasant experiences. When you have the very pleasant, beautiful experiences, naturally desire is the underlying tendency in every pleasant not every, uh, some pleasant experiences, greed as underlying tendency. Um, and there are other pleasant experiences which don't have greed as underlying tendencies. And these two we have to separate, differentiate, understand clearly. If I have time, I, I will explain these two separately. All come under mindfulness. Hamdune, I was actually listening to your talk today, this morning, the question and answer session. So there was one person who asked you, that person was a meditator, and then uh, he was saying that uh, eventually he started seeing a star closer to his... Uh, uh, eyes or somewhere. So, uh, so I think that uh, that person was asking whether that person experienced something like what you said, like some blissful situations. Uh, uh, right. It, it, it can happen to anybody, but in uh, mindfulness practice, we must understand even that is an impediment. If you simply have uh, bright light and stars and feeling like very peaceful and happy and so forth, then immediately without your awareness, greed arises to hold on to that. When you practice mindfulness, you use that state to develop mindfulness rather than getting carried away with that pleasant, beautiful, blissful experience. Mindfulness is a more mature 
that blissful, peaceful is just emotion, emotional. Any low degree of meditation can have that. But this is very specialized, mature uh, mental state. We have to be the wise mental state. And that is why Buddha said, uh, this Dhamma is for the wise, not for the unwise. Any unwise person can have this blissful, peaceful, happy state. The mindful person will be more cautious, more patient, more aware, where that experience takes him, where the experience takes him. Uh, can there be hallucinations too? Like sure, sure. A lot of hallucinations. Hallucinations, daydreams, fantasies, all can happen during meditation. Actually, those are the impediments. Uh, we have to guard ourselves against them with mindfulness. Recognize some fantasy as fantasy, daydream as daydream, and then let it go. Because these are temporary uh, things which does not bring any insight, any wisdom. Okay? I think, friends, uh, let me uh, close this session. I hope more children uh, participate in this uh, and uh, benefit from this. I like every child whether Buddhist or not, Sri Lankan or not, uh, learn meditation, especially Vipassana meditation. So uh, try to encourage other children. Next week also I talk about Vipassana meditation. Okay? Thank you. Let me turn off. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you.